Good morning. Okay. <laughs> Is it? I'm not sure. Good <laughs> morning. Thank you. Good morning. I know it's hard. We'll get you. We'll get you there. We'll get you there. But we are grateful to have you here, both those of you who are in the sanctuary and those of you who are watching online or watching archive. We're grateful to have you be a part of our contemporary worship here at Crozet United Methodist Church this morning. I'm Sarah, the pastor here. And as we begin our worship this morning, let's take a moment and come together in prayer. Will you pray with me? Lord, as we begin this worship this day, we are grateful for the opportunity to be with you and with one another. The incredible gift of gathering in your name, being edified by your presence and your grace, and the ability to experience your love in profound ways. Because Lord, there is a lot of work ahead of us. Work in ourselves, in our homes, in our schools, our jobs, our community, and this world. And we know, Lord, that all things are possible through you. So we pray that your love will flow over us and through us and allow us to carry that back out into the world to do the work of discipleship in our Lord's name. May you challenge us to grow, but also encourage us to persevere through any trial or tribulation that lies before us. Thank you for your forgiveness and for your willingness to grant grace to us as soon as we ask for it. So we are here to envelop ourselves in that same grace through the means of grace that is worship. Thank you, God, for this opportunity and for your goodness and grace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. We're going to invite you to stand as you are able. We're going to begin this morning with our music and start with We Believe. Yeah. 
Please be seated. And if there are children who would like to come forward for children's time, you're welcome to do that. Good morning. Good morning. Come on up so you can see, because I got some things I'm going to show you. Hi, how are you? Come on up. There's seats over here, too, if you want to sit over here. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you in just a second. So we are starting a new worship series all about women in the Bible. And today we're going to start with a woman whom you may have heard of, or you may just recognize her first name. We're going to talk about Mary Magdalene. All right. Mary Magdalene was one of the first people to get to see Jesus resurrected, find out about Easter, and then she was told to go and tell the disciples. So you see her, she's here in red, and she's talking to the disciples, and she's saying, Jesus is risen, right? That's our message on Easter. So this is what's called an icon. This is something that is painted in a very specific way, and it's used for people to meditate and pray and think about parts of the Bible. But there have been other depictions of Mary, right? So you'll notice here, what color is she wearing? Red. Red, right? Red is an important color in the church, right? We wear it at Pentecost on the church's birthday. We wear it especially when we're doing things that... And on the 4th of July, yes. There are people that wear that there too. Uh, But we wear it especially when we're talking about the Holy Spirit. And so here is another picture someone did of Mary. Looks a little different, right? Uh, You'll notice she has a darker red. We call this scarlet here. What color is her hair? Kind of reddish, right? Kind of orangey red. Yeah, she's got red hair here, right? So back in the Bible, most people didn't have red hair. If they had red hair, it was worth noting, and so the Bible would tell us. But here you have a picture where they've decided that Mary has red hair. And then here's another one right? Now, you can't really see her hair, but her head covering is red, right? You see that? And you'll notice she's holding something in her hand. Do you know what that is? It kind of looks like a ball, but it's supposed to be an egg, like an Easter egg, right? Because she was there on the first Easter. And so you can see that they're all different, right? Which one's right? You think the middle one's right? I think that's probably as close as we get with these three because none of them are actually right because did we have pictures back then when Mary was with Jesus? No, we didn't. And guess what? The Bible is not always really good at giving us all the little details that we would need to paint a picture. And so a lot of people have filled in the blanks. Now, it's one thing to fill in the blanks and make somebody into a good person. It's another when you fill in the blanks and you make it so people don't think very nicely of them. Which one do you think God would have us do? Good. Paint people good. Yeah, right? We give them the benefit of the doubt and we want to think of people as being good. And Jesus seemed fond of her because all four gospel accounts have Mary there and Jesus decides to reveal himself to her on the first Easter. So you don't usually do that and then entrust somebody that you don't like with a good message, right? That's not usually what we do. So we're going to be talking here in the, in the sanctuary more about Mary, but Mary was one of the first people to be able to experience Jesus, and then she was told to go and tell, Bo, Bo, Bo. <laughs> and then she had to go tell. So I want you to just think about that. The next time you hear anybody, uh, so a child or a teenager or an adult talking, listen to how we talk about people, right? Because when we are talking about people, should we be talking about people in a way that shows that God loves them too? Yes, that's how we should do that. But that's not always how we behave because sometimes we default to the other side. So we want to be real careful about the pictures we are painting with our words, okay? That's the lesson of Mary Magdalene because not everybody always did that and that wasn't really fair to her and guess what one day you're all going to get to meet her because i have no doubt that she is one of those people that's going to be greeting us in the kingdom to come all right are you ready for children's worship okay so we have got our lights who has not had an opportunity to take one of the candles who has not you have not okay 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 who are you going with the older children or the younger ones Nope, perfect. Okay. 
You're going with the big or are you staying here? You're going to go? Okay, because we need you to take the light. But if you're going to stay, then we'll have to do something different. <laughs> okay, are you guys ready? We'll get you a candle next time, honey, okay? We're going to all take turns. I want a candle. We will take turns, okay? All right, and then you bring it back when you come back in the offering. All right, we'll see you in a little bit, okay? All right. <laughs> All right, before we hear our scripture that recounts for us Mary Magdalene, let's go to the Lord in prayer once more. Let us pray together. Lord, it is through the movement and the power of the Holy Spirit that you convey divine wisdom to us, that you help us to experience your truth and help us to claim our own. And so as people who worship and adore the resurrected Christ, we pray that what we discover this day through our thoughts and our words and our experiences in worship, will help us to appreciate better how you are capable of doing extraordinary things through ordinary people, and that it is our opportunity to serve that truly elevates our lives into exceptional. We are grateful that you give us these opportunities, Lord. And even when we fail to move forward into those open doors, you always love us and encourage us to try again. May this be a day where we feel confident to go forth and do the things that you have asked us to do. In the name of our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is going to come to us from the gospel account of Mark, chapter 15, verse 42, through chapter 16, verse 8. When the evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. When Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph brought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, Joseph, saw where the body was laid. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look. There is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Amen. So this is traditionally an Easter text. Obviously, it's recounting when the women arrived at the tomb and they thought they were going to have the opportunity to honor Jesus one final time by anointing his body and preparing him to be permanently sealed in the tomb. But unfortunately, that was not what was going to happen because all of their plans were about to be completely put aside. And so they had been preparing themselves to have a very emotional morning. They had been preparing themselves to do a very important job, but a job that was going to be very heart-rending all the same. And then they get there, and unfortunately for them, something else has happened entirely. And they're terrified and amazed, and they're alarmed, and they're trying to make sense of what is happening. They know that he died. In fact, the text tells us that they were some of the ones that were there that witnessed the crucifixion and his final breath. And then all of a sudden, 
He's not there. These women knew that he had died. So where is he? Now, Mary Magdalene plays a central role in all four gospel accounts on Easter. Regardless of which one you read, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, she is there. Sometimes she is the only one there. Sometimes she is accompanied by other women. But Mary Magdalene is unequivocally, according to all four New Testament gospel accounts, there for Easter. In fact, next to Mary, the mother of Jesus, she is the most mentioned woman in the New Testament. Now, you would think that we would have a lot more to say about Mary Magdalene. And in fact, you may have seen portrayals of Mary Magdalene. Usually, they're not very flattering. Like in this one, luckily none of the kids picked up on how seductive looking she is. But that's one of the ways that she has been reframed. We don't know hardly anything about Mary, which is astounding if you go and you Google Mary Magdalene and just go look at the images. You'll be amazed at how she has been portrayed over the years. She has often shown sometimes naked, sometimes naked but strategically covered with hair because most of those pictures were in chapels and they wanted some decorum when they referred to her. But you start to wonder, why is she depicted that way? Even though crucifixions were performed nude, we always clothe Jesus in our images of the crucifixion. We cover his nakedness, as was not only prescribed in the Old Testament, but what we feel is appropriate. But Mary Magdalene, we haven't always given that same respect toward. And the question is, why? Why is it? Well, she is one of what we would call an infamous woman of the Bible. Now, infamous is not usually a good way to describe somebody or something. Often they are known for something that is less than admirable, sometimes bad or even wicked, a deed or how their behavior has been or who they are considered to be. And Mary Magdalene has often been portrayed like this. But why? Why has she been portrayed this way? when obviously the New Testament authors of our gospel accounts knew that she was there, that she had been privileged with some of the first indications of the Easter resurrection. She was one of those that had actually been charged, according to the gospel account of Mark, with telling the others, go and tell them. This is a role previously in scripture that had been entirely done by angels. Angels were the ones who went to tell. Angels were the ones that conveyed divine messages. But here, all of a sudden, Jesus is pivoting, and the word is going to come to us by this woman, sometimes other women with her, but definitively Mary. Why? Why has this changed? Why is this not the way that we convey Mary Magdalene? Well, unfortunately for you, I had a seminary class on Mary Magdalene. So about 50 minutes from now, when I've concluded... No, I'm kidding. I'm not going to talk to you for 50 minutes about Mary Magdalene, but I could, but I won't. But what was so astounding in the class was it only took us one week to read everything the Bible said about Mary. I mean, two sessions, you know, I think it was a Tuesday, Thursday class, and we were done with the biblical account. I'm going, how are we going to fill the rest of a semester with no Bible? Because now we're going to see where the imaginations of humankind go with her. We're going to see how people have treated her and how they choose to think of her. Why is she maligned? Well, unfortunately, sometimes good people do bad things. Sometimes people who have good intentions unintentionally sin. And for a lot of the church history, we have unintentionally sinned against Mary Magdalene. We have maligned her. We have profaned her good acts by choosing to think of her in ways that were not biblically accurate, that we don't really have any substance for. And instead, it's because that's just how people started to think about her. But why? What was the catalyst for that? Often when you ask people about Mary Magdalene, they'll mention red hair. Bible doesn't say she has red hair. They'll mention the fact that she was a prostitute or that she engaged in sexual immorality. The Bible doesn't say this. In fact, the only thing the Bible really says about her is that she was from Magdalena. That's the area that she was from, just as we have Martha and Mary of Bethany. We have Mary of Magdalene. 
And then we have the idea that is reiterated just a few uh, verses later in the Gospel account of Mark that apparently Jesus had healed her of seven demons, seven unclean spirits. Either, either translation that you have, Jesus had encountered her and healed her. It's estimated that she was actually a little older than Jesus, maybe even a generation older than Jesus, because she seems to be able to have a lot of autonomy that someone younger than Jesus wouldn't have had. She has the ability to follow Jesus and help to tend to the apostles, help to make sure that they were fed and that they were clothed properly and hopefully in clean clothes, as clean as you could get back in those days. And she was one of the women that is referenced as helping to take care of our itinerant apostles. And so what we find is, I have read you the original conclusion of Mark. Mark originally ended, it's the first gospel account that was written down, and it originally ended with all of them being seized with terror and amazement and fleeing and telling no one anything. Well, obviously that isn't true because we're Christians and we worship on Easter and we believe that the resurrection happened. So obviously they eventually did tell people you know, I mean, sometimes, you know, you learn something, you're like, I got to sit with this for a minute before we talk about it. Maybe that's what they were doing. Who knows? I mean, it would be pretty astounding to go and suddenly find that the loved one that you went to go visit in the cemetery was suddenly not there anymore. And so there was a lot of processing that they probably needed to do. But even the, the writers and the future scribes of Mark found this unsatisfying. So then they wrote another shorter ending as kind of a coda to the original one. And it said this, and all that had been commanded of them was told briefly to those around Peter. And afterwards, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation which is obviously written later, because if you've ever read Mark, those are not words that Mark uses. The imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. It's just not something Mark talks about. So you can tell that there's already this yearning for more. Who were they? What did they do? What happens next? Well, like all good people of the Bible, people want to fill in the blanks. And on September 14th of 1591, in a homily, which is a shorter version of a sermon, in Rome, Pope Gregory the Great will make one of the first crucial errors about Mary Magdalene. Now let me qualify that. I don't believe Gregory the Great was trying to cause trouble for Mary Magdalene. I don't think he was trying to cause trouble at all. Back then, most people couldn't read the Bible. They didn't have access to it, they couldn't read. They certainly didn't read in Latin, which was the way in which it was published or the way in which it was continually copied. And so they relied upon their clergy to read the text to them and then explain it. They relied upon that. And so that is a heavy mantle. As somebody who does that upon occasion, it's not easy to convey what's in scripture in a meaningful way and often making sure that it's without error. That's not an easy thing to do. And so Pope Gregory gets up to do this. And when the Pope speaks in Rome, most people listen. And when he did this, he made a conflation error. He combined Mary Magdalene with the unnamed sinner in the gospel account of Luke and Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus of Bethany. He combined three women into one. It's kind of a reverse trinity kind of thing happening here. He combines them into one. Now the problem with that is, clearly all four gospel accounts know who Mary Magdalene is. Very obvious they do. And the gospel account of Mark is not opposed to telling you who somebody is before you figure out what they even have to do in the story. If you go back a few chapters, even before where we started, there's a healing that happens of blind Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. And that's how the gospel writer of Mark begins that little story. Then there was the blind beggar, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. And you're like, who is this guy? The author knew who he was, and he was going to tell you right from the start. So we have past precedent that in the scriptures, if they knew who somebody was, they told you who they were. They didn't wait and hide it till the end. They started out that way. Because remember, most people didn't have access to the Bible. So you had to tell them the name from the beginning and then tell it again. You couldn't just be like, and now the person that none of us have referred to by name is Mary Magdalene. Nobody would ever believe that. That's not how it worked back then. 
So unfortunately, in his attempt to be a good steward of God's word and in his desire to help people understand and appreciate the Bible, Pope Gregory the Great got up way back in 1591 and made a little error. But the problem is that when a pope speaks, especially as far as church law goes, they're creating doctrine. Now what you preach in a homily isn't supposed to create doctrine, but more people listen to the sermons of the pope than read papal bulls. So more people heard what he said and repeated it. But also, if you are a Catholic cardinal or a bishop or a priest, and the pope has just preached this, then that is now your truth, and you're going to echo it. And then when you're in charge of a chapel and you hire someone to paint beautiful frescoes up on your ceilings and in the alcoves of your chapel walls, then when they come to the point and they start asking you questions, you're going to be like, well, apparently she was a sinful woman, so let's depict that. Let's start finding ways to show that. And so a lot of times they use the color red, but in Christianity, red is not the color of sexual immorality. Otherwise, we got a problem because Jesus is wearing a lot of red in our pictures. But no, they were meant to use red as the presence of the Holy Spirit. Hence, in the icon I showed the children, she's wearing red because the Holy Spirit is upon her to preach the good news, to tell them the truth. So why is it that for almost 2,000 years now, there have been a lot of Christians that are happy to tell you things that malign Mary Magdalene? Why? Well, it's juicier that way, isn't it? Isn't it more amazing that Jesus could take a prostitute who had been uh, completely endued with evil spirits and he could help her and then she could become a great disciple, such a great disciple that she would be privileged on Easter with the message of the resurrection? That sounds like a great redemptive story. But I'm pretty sure that most of us wouldn't be like, in order for my transformation from sinner into believer to be more effective, I need to have a rap sheet about sexual sin. I don't think most of us want that. Now, I actually have talked to some people who have heard it said that people find the idea that she was a prostitute to be comforting. Huh. Okay. Uh, explain that one to me. Well, it means that she was such a big sinner, because apparently that's a bigger sin than other things, but she was such a big sinner that if God can love her, then I'm going to be okay. Okay, so now Mary Magdalene is really good because she makes it okay for us to have lesser sins. I don't really think that's the point of the Bible. I think the point of the Bible is telling us that Mary Magdalene was willing to do what was right by Jesus when it was hard, when it was scary, when it meant that she was putting herself at physical risk. She was willing to do what no one else would do because she knew it was the right thing to do by Jesus. And so she did. And when Jesus rewarded her with that Easter experience, she did what he told her again. Go and tell them. Now, multiple gospel accounts will tell us that they didn't believe her. He's not resurrected. We're all not all holed up here in a room in the darkness and hiding from the authorities because we believe he's resurrected. And even the gospel account of John has the beloved disciple and Peter having to run down and check for themselves. Maybe Mary got the tomb wrong. Maybe she didn't have the right directions. Maybe Mary was confused and, you know, just overwhelmed with emotion. But no, Mary knew what she had seen and what she had heard. Mary knows whether there's a body or not. And so she begins to be maligned, right? Almost because it made people feel better that she was worse. I mean, I know that's not something that we still do in our culture today. I know that's not. But here's the point about Mary Magdalene. The point about Mary Magdalene is that repeatedly you will hear people say things that are not true about Mary Magdalene. Right? And there's a part of me that always wants to go, that's not right. That's not right. And then, you know, an entire semester wants to, like, come out. And I know that that's not true. So then you have to decide, you know, am I even going to go down this rabbit hole with this person? 
Or am I just going to let Mary continue to be maligned? But the more and I live, and the more that I know how words and gossip and perception and impressions can cause pain and suffering, the more I find myself going, you know, I'm just going to say this. That's not accurate according to the Bible, and you might want to go back and read it. You might want to go back and read it, because I think you'll find that Mary is not what we portray her to be. What we do know about Mary is that she was there, she was privileged, she was gifted, and she had been given a gift and she didn't squander it on herself, she told it. She told it so far and so true and so consistently that she is mentioned more than any other woman other than the mother of Jesus. Quite an accomplishment in a book that's not too hot on women. It's quite, it's quite an accomplishment. And there are all kinds of conspiracy theories about why Mary was like buried or maligned. Now, I'm sure that there are people who have prejudice. I'm sure that there are people who were like, you know what, some of these women are getting a little out of control. I'm sure. Sometimes Paul even says that, right? Sometimes, you know, everybody's getting out of control. I got news for you. You read all of Paul, everybody's out of control. But we like to pick, except him, right? Because he's got it on lock. And the problem is that if you read just pieces, then you miss the entire narrative. You're just picking and choosing, right? Have you ever wanted to be one of those people that's like, I'm going to go to the movie theater, and I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to watch the opening credits, and then I'm going to get up, and I'm going to go out into the lobby for about 30 minutes. Then I'm going to come back in, and I'm going to stand in the back for about five minutes, and then I'm going to leave again. And then I might stick my head back in for another two minutes, but then I'm going to leave. And then right before the credits start rolling, I'm going to come in and I'm going to sit down and I'm going to watch the last seven minutes. It's a great way to watch a movie, isn't it? You miss the movie. And most of the time, if somebody's moving all the time, you're like, sit down, I'm trying to watch a movie. Instead, we read the Bible like that. Sometimes we read the Bible like when it suits us, or we only read the Bible at certain times and for a certain amount of a length of time, instead of saying, you know, there might be something here. Because there were early communities within Christianity who looked at Mary Magdalene and didn't see a sexual sinner. They saw someone who had overcome adversity, who had been healed by Jesus. They saw someone who did something that was pretty radical in her day. She told a bunch of men the truth of God. And when they decided to listen to her, then they got to see for themselves. But, again, this is an opportunity for us here and now in 2023 to go, you know, not, not, not meaning to hurt anybody's feelings, but there was somebody who made a mistake. He, Pope Gregory the Great would not be the first person to ever make a mistake in biblical scholarship. He won't be the last. But his mistake caused pain and suffering. Can you imagine getting into the kingdom to come, and there's Mary Magdalene, who I have no doubt will be like, let me introduce you to Jesus. Know him real well. And you're like, why aren't you wearing red? I thought you were a redhead. You know, did you ever have any, like, problems from being a prostitute? And she would be like, excuse me? But there's, like, generations of Christians who think that that's her. And that's wrong. Because let me tell you something, my siblings in Christ, you are bigger than your sins. Amen. You are bigger than your mistakes. God loves you more than any sin you could ever commit. And if God's not going to hold that against you, then what business do we have? Amen. Whether she was a prostitute or not, does it matter? She was a sinner like all of us. She was a sinner. But how many of us got to see the resurrection? How many of us got to be there when Jesus was feeding the thousands or when Jesus was healing the lepers and the blind, when Jesus was preaching and teaching in an earthly body. How many of us got to be there? But wouldn't we love to have been? And so it becomes an opportunity for us to go, you know, I don't really know that I can change how the world thinks about Mary Magdalene. Don't know that I can do that. I don't think I have that kind of platform or that kind of authority. I don't think I can. But are there Mary Magdalene's in your world? 
Are there Mary Magdalene's in your spheres where you travel? Are there people, not just women, but are there people, human beings, beloved beings of sacred worth that are being maligned unfairly? And maybe you can't undo what we've done to Mary Magdalene, but can you undo what is being done to them? Can you stand up and say, you know what? I don't think that's true and I don't think it matters. What really matters is what she did and who Jesus said she was. Not what she did every single day or what she did wrong, but what she did. And if she hadn't done what she had done according to all four gospel accounts, then we wouldn't be here. Because Easter would have remained sealed in the tomb. A secret. But instead, because of her courage and her conviction, but even more so, her relationship with Jesus, we are blessed to know that Easter happened. We are blessed to know that all of us are worth giving eternal life to and that we are worth being saved by the cross. Amen. That's the message of Mary Magdalene. So the next time you have the opportunity to go, you know what, I, that's just gossip. You know what, I don't even know that that's true. Or you know what, I don't know if that's true, but let me tell you a redemptive story about that person. Let me tell you how they've helped me. Let me tell you what I have seen them do that is good. Because the kids knew we're called to be talking about people by giving them the benefit of the doubt that they're good. That's what we're called to be. And if we are constantly people that are looking for the worst in others, that is a standard that we don't want God to be using against us. We want to be a group of people who say, you know, we're going to give the benefit of the doubt. We're going to hope and pray that there is grace at work in that person because we hope and pray and, and hopefully know that there's some grace working in here. But we do have an opportunity to help prevent other people from becoming the next Mary Magdalene. May we discover that our voices, those same voices that have been given to us by the power of the Holy Spirit that have been a blessing bestowed upon us by the living Christ, a blessing that was given to us even before by God our Creator, that we can use our voice, our power, our authority, our relationship and our goodwill to change how others are understood for the better. Because wouldn't you like to know that when someone is maligning you that there is someone who's willing to stand up and say, that's not him. I've experienced him like this. I have seen him do wonderful things. And I know that God loves him. That is our duty if we truly believe that Easter was given to us. So even though it's January and I just re read you an Easter text, I will remind you what one of my liturgical professors told me in seminary. And that is that every Sunday is a little Easter. Every Sunday is a chance to remember that that tomb is empty, that our Lord is resurrected, raised from the dead, and that we have been given new life here and now and in eternity. May it be so. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. We're now going to have an opportunity to worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings, and we are grateful for that opportunity because it means that what we have labored for and endeavored through will be the ability to bless other people with our gifts. So let us worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings.
Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, as we take this moment to honor and glorify you with our prayers, our presence, and our gifts, we are grateful for the opportunity to continue that good work, not just by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry, but by all of those who carry on in his name and in his power, those who use what we have in order to bless others, for we know how richly we have been blessed. May others discover that you are with them and for them, that you love them and forgive them and grant them eternal grace. May it be so, and may this time be part of that holy and eternal work. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. We have some quick announcements we're going to share with you. The first is that if you've been looking for an opportunity to sing, and you want to have an opportunity to sing some of those classic songs, we are looking to expand our choir at 11 o'clock. And so if you would like to be a part of that, it's an incredible group. They're, they are themselves a small group, and uh, they care for one another and have a beautiful relationship. And if you would like to experience that, then you're welcome to do that. They practice on Thursday nights, and they sing each week at the 11 a.m. worship service. You don't have to commit to singing at every single 11 a.m. worship service, but you will have that opportunity if you so like. Uh, you can sing and worship with us and worship God through your gift of your voice and your music. So you can reach out to Gary. Um, you can reach out to him through his email, Gary at Crozet United Methodist or, dot org, or he tends to be around, so he's up there. Uh, you, you can have an opportunity to talk with him and find out how you can be part of that ministry. And then we are looking uh, once more to see if you have a phone that you would like to donate to aid in our audiovisual ministry. Ever since the pandemic, we have been utilizing old iPhones that people have upgraded beyond, and we're currently seeking donations of iPhone 7s or newer to replace the supply that we currently have and so if you have one or you know someone that's looking to get rid of an iPhone 7 or, or newer then we would love to be able to receive that and use that to continue our online ministry uh, and then I want to also let you know that if you're not aware the 11 o'clock worship service as this one is is filmed and recorded and then on Sunday afternoons we go over to the lodge and old trail and we play that service for them and this is part of helping to allow others who are not always able to get here at the time on Sunday morning to experience our worship in our body of Christ. And you can continue to help that. You can contact the church office or you can email BART, communications at crozetunitedmethodist.org if you have questions about the phone or if you'd like to do that. And then our middle school youth group will be meeting this evening at 5.30, games, snacks, and a fellowship. And yes, they're working on the details, but um, you can... But yes, the youth leadership guarantees it will be a blast. Thank you. Uh, if you have questions, you can email Bart Communications at CrozetUnitedMethodist.org. And here's a video of the last couple events at Middle School Youth. Yes, sometimes you need to throw giant burritos. That's just a thing that happens. Um, and thank you. There's some of the folks who were very successful at throwing giant burritos are here today. Miles, I'm looking at you, bud. All right. So um, a couple of updates here. Um, 
the step up and jump in, we asked uh, at the end of last year uh, as a congregation to step up and jump in. Uh, our finance chair, Mike Micucci, is going to have a lot more details on the 2022 budget and the financial outlook for 2023 on January 29th. But I'm pleased to say that we nearly reached our stretch goal, just $3,126 short of the $175,575 goal we set to support our ministry efforts. In a time where many churches are struggling to survive and recover from the pandemic, that is just incredible. Uh, thank you for stepping up, jumping in, and making a difference in the life of our church's ministry. And yes, like, we got that. Like That's awesome. Um, and it's cool. I, I'm really proud of this graphic. Uh, it continues to update itself. Uh, 